are jumping into Laura Hillenbrand's Unbroken in chapter 23, which is called Monster, and it starts on page 237. Uh, but before we jump in, hopefully you remember from chapter 22 that Louis and some of the other prisoners of war had tried to make an escape plan, and that escape plan ended up failing. Um, and there was one of the guards called the Quack who actually beat one of the men really brutally because he had had these maps and things and got found out. I need to clarify something. In chapter 22, I said that the quack was the person who would come to be kind of the antagonist of our story. Clarification, I turned the page and remembered that this man, the bird, is really who's going to become our antagonist. Quack, bird, you see the confusion. While the quack was uh, extremely brutal and really hurt this other prisoner of war, uh, the bird is the one who we're going to focus on. So sorry for that confusion, but we are jumping in with our new chapter today, Monster. Remember that Louis has just been sent to a new prisoner of war camp. And so uh, this is where we start today. Here we go. It was late morning on the last day of September, 1944. Louis, Frank Tinker, and a handful of other Ofuna veterans stood by the front gate of the Omori POW camp, which sat on an artificial island in Tokyo Bay. The island was nothing more than a sandy spit, connected to shore by a tenuous thread of bamboo slats. Across the water was the bright bustle of Tokyo, still virtually untouched by the war. Other than the patches of early snow scattered over the, over the ground like hopscotch squares, every inch of the camp was ashen, otherworldly gray, reminding one POW of the moon. There were no birds anywhere. They were standing before a small office where they'd been told to wait. In front of them, Standing beside the building was a Japanese corporal. He was leering at them. I'm sorry, you can't see. Uh, leering, like making a face at them that's almost taunting them. He was a beautifully crafted man, a few years short of 30. His face was handsome, with full lips that turned up slightly at the edges, giving his mouth a faintly cruel expression. Beneath his smartly tailored uniform, his body was perfectly balanced, his torso radiating power, his form trim. A sword angled elegantly off his hip, and circling his waist was a broad-webbed belt embellished with an enormous metal buckle. The only incong incongruities, so things that stuck out on this striking corporal, were his hands, huge, brutish animal things that one man would liken to paws. So he's a pretty good-looking guy, except he has these giant hands, and that really sticks out. You can see it here. Louis and the other prisoners stood at attention, arms stiff, hands flat to their sides. The corporal continued to stare, but said nothing. Near him stood another man who wore a second lieutenant's insignia, yet hovered about the lower ranking corporal with eager servility, so like ready to serve him. Five, perhaps 10 minutes passed and the corporal never moved. Then abruptly, he swept the prisoners, the second lieutenant scurrying behind. He walked with his chin high and his chest puffed. His gestures exaggerated and imperious. He began to inspect the men with the, the air of possession, looking them over, Louis thought, as if he were God himself. Down the line, the corporal strode, pausing before each man, raking his eyes over him and barking, name. When he reached Louis, he stopped. Louis gave his name. The corporal's eyes narrowed. Decades after the war, men who had looked into those eyes would be unable to shake the memory of what they saw in them, a wrongness that elicited a twist in the gut, a prickle up the back of the neck. Louis dropped his eyes. There was a rush in the air, the corporal's arms swinging, then a fist thudding into Louis's head. Louis staggered. Why you no look in my eye, the corporal shouted. The other men in the line went rigid. Louis steadied himself. He held his face taut as he raised his eyes to the corporal's face. Again came the whirling arm, the jarring blow into his skull, his stumbling legs trying to hold him upright. You know, look at me. This man, thought Tinker, is a psychopath. The corporal marched the men to a quarantine area where, they, where there stood a rickety canopy. He ordered the men to stand beneath it, then left. Hours passed. The men stood, the cold working its way up their sleeves and pant legs. Eventually, they sat down. The morning gave way to a long, cold afternoon. The corporal didn't come back. Louis saw a wooden apple box lying nearby. Remembering his Boy Scout friction fire training, he grabbed the box and broke it up. 
He asked one of the other men to unthread the lace from his boot. He fashioned a spindle out of a bamboo stick, fitted into a hole in a slat from the apple box, wound the boot lace around the spindle, and began alternately pulling the ends, turning the spindle. After a good bit of work, smoke rose from the spindle. Louis picked up bits of discarded tatami mat, laid them on the smoking area, and blew on them. The mat remnants whooshed into flames. The men gathered close to the fire, and cigarettes emerged from pockets. Everyone got warmer. The corporal suddenly appeared. Nanda, Nanda, he said, a word that roughly translates to, what the hell is going on? He demanded to know where they'd gotten matches. Louis explained how he had built the fire. The corporal's face clouded over. Without warning, the corporal slugged Louis in the head, then swung his arm back for another blow. Louis wanted to duck, but he fought the instinct, knowing from Ofuna that this would only provoke more blows. So he stood still, holding his expression neutral, as the second swing connected with his head. The corporal ordered them to put the fire out, then walked away. Louis had met the man who would dedicate himself to shattering him. So up until this point in our book, it's pretty much been Louis is our protagonist, and then the antagonist has been, you know, the plane crash, the war, and it's very much been like a man versus nature, maybe a little bit of man versus society as we're having um, Louis as a prisoner of war. But this is the first time that we're seeing a true, like, single antagonist come out as our story kind of becomes more of a man versus man type conflict. So that's going to change how our story reads just a little bit moving forward. The corporal's name was Mutsuhiro Watanabe. He was born during World War I, the fourth of six children of Shizuka Watanabe, a lovely and exceptionally wealthy woman. The Watanabes enjoyed a privileged life, having amassed riches through ownership of Tokyo's Takamatsu Hotel and other real estate mines in uh, other real estate and mines in Nagano and Manchuria. Mutsuhiro, whose father, a pilot, seems to have died or left the family when Mutsuhiro was relatively young, grew up on luxury's lap, living in beautiful homes all over Japan, reportedly waited on by servants and swimming in his family's private pool. His siblings knew him as affection affectionately as Muchan. After a childhood in Kobe, Mutsuhiro attended Tokyo's prestigious Waseda University, where he studied French literature and cultivated an infatuation with nihilism. Nihilism is going to mean that religion and moral values are meaningless. It's kind of that philosophical idea. In 1942, he graduated, settled in Tokyo, and took a job at a news agency. He worked there for only one month. Japan was at war, and Mitsuhiro was deeply patriotic. He enlisted in the army. Watanabe had lofty expectations for himself as a soldier. One of his older brothers was an officer, and his older sister's husband was commander of Chang Changai, a giant POW camp in Singapore. Attending an officer's rank was of supreme, excuse me, attaining an officer's rank was of supreme importance to Watanabe. And when he applied to become an officer, he probably thought that acceptance was his due, given his education and pedigree, but he was rejected. He would be only a corporal. By all accounts, this was the moment that derailed him, leaving him feeling disgraced, infuriated, and bitterly jealous of officers. Those who knew him would say that every part of his mind gathered around this blazing humiliation, and every subsequent or following action was informed by it. This defining event would have tragic consequences for hundreds of men. Okay, so we see here that he really wanted to be an officer in the army, and when he doesn't reach that goal, he feels like he's been humiliated, he's been embarrassed, and all of his actions are going to come out of this place of embarrassment. That's really important to understanding him as a character. We're going to hold on to that moving forward. Corporal Watanabe, so not an officer, was sent to a regiment of the Imperial Guards in Tokyo, stationed near Hirohito's palace. As the war hadn't yet come to Japan's home islands, he saw no combat. In the fall of 1943, for unknown reasons, Watanabe was transferred to the military's most ignominious station for NCOs, a POW camp. Perhaps his superiors wanted to rid the Imperial Guards of an unstable and venomous soldier, or perhaps they wanted to put his volatility to use. So they're saying that Watanabe, he's unstable, so like unpredictable and venomous. He's poisonous. He'll hurt people. 
And they said they want to put his volatility to use. Volatility means he's really unpredictable. He might kind of explode without a lot of warning. Wanabi was assigned to Amori and designated the disciplinary officer. On the last day of November 1943, Watanabe arrived. Even prior to Watanabe's appearance, Amori had been a trying place, a difficult place. The 1929 Geneva Convention, which Japan had signed but never ratified, permitted detaining powers to use POWs for labor with restrictions. So the Geneva Convention basically set the rules for war and for how you can treat prisoners. So they're saying you can have prisoners do label, labor or do work, but there are rules to it. The laborers had to be physically fit and the labor couldn't be dangerous, unhealthy, or unreasonably difficult. The work had to be unconnected to the operations of war, so they can't like build guns or anything like that. And the POWs were to be given pay commensurate with their labor. So they can't do like slave labor, they have to get paid for it. Finally, to ensure that POW officers had control over their men, they could not be forced to work. So the prisoners should be able to say no to any work. Virtually nothing about Japan's use of POWs was in keeping with the Geneva Convention. To be an enlisted prisoner of war under the Japanese was to be a slave. The Japanese government made contracts with private companies to send enlisted POWs to factories, mines, docks, and railways where the men were forced into exceptionally arduous, really difficult war production or war transport labor. So remember, they're not supposed to work for things that benefit the war, but that's what they're doing. The labor performed under club-wielding foremen, so the foremen have clubs and would beat them if they don't work, was so dangerous and exhausting that thousands of POWs died on the job. In the extremely rare instances in which the Japanese compensated or paid the POWs for their work, payment amounted to almost nothing, equivalent to a few pennies a week. The only aspect of the Geneva Convention that the Japanese sometimes respected was the prohibition on forcing officers to work. Like almost every other camp, Amori was a slave camp. For 10 to 11 hours a day, seven days a week, Amori's enlisted POWs did backbreaking labor at shipyards, rail yards, truck loading stations, a sand pit, and a coal yard. Men had to be on the verge of death to be spared. Minimum fever levels for exemption were 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So they won't let you off the hook for working unless you have a 104 degree temperature. The labor was extremely grueling. According to POW Tom Wade, each man at the Tokyo rail yards lifted a total of 20 to 30 tons of material a day. A ton is 2,000 pounds. Probably because Amori was used as a show camp where prisoners were displayed for the Red Cross, the, man were, the men were paid 10 yen per, per month, less than the price of a pack of cigarettes. But they were permitted. They were permitted to spend it only on a tiny selection of worthless goods at a camp canteen. So the money came right back to the Japanese. Compounding the hardship of Amori was the food situation. The rations were better quality than those at Ofuna, but were doled out in only slightly larger quantities. Because officers weren't enslaved, they were allowed only half the ration given to slaves on the justification that they needed fewer calories. Along with rice, the men received some vegetables, but protein was almost non-existent. About once a week, someone would push a wheelbarrow into the camp bearing meat, but a, wheelbarrow, a wheelbarrow's worth was spread over hundreds of men. A serving amounted to about a thimble-sized portion. It consisted of things like lungs and intestines, assorted dog parts, something the POWs called elephant semen, and once a mystery lump that after considerable speculation, the men decided was a horse's vagina. So this is not the meat that these people really want to eat. Just as at Ofuna, beriberi and other preventable diseases were epidemic at Omori. Because rations were halved for sick men who were unable to work, the ill couldn't recover. Right? So if you're sick, you get less food, but then you don't have enough food, so you never get better. Men harrowed by dysentery, the benjo boogie, swallowed lumps of coal or burnt stick to slow the digestive waterfall. So when you have dysentery, you just have diarrhea and everything just leaves your body instantly. Many men weighed less than 90 pounds. The only saving grace of Omori prior to November 1943 had been the attitude of the Japanese personnel. 
who weren't nearly as vicious as those at Ofuna. The prisoners gave them nicknames, including Hogjaw, Baby Dumpling, Bucktooth, Genghis Khan, and Roving Reporter. One unfortunate officer, wrote POW Lewis Bush, wore puffy pants and walked as though he was always bursting to go to the lavatory, prompting the men to call him Lieutenant Shit and Breaches. There were a few rogues and one or two outright loons, but several camp employees were friendly. The rest were indifferent, enforcing the rules with blows, but at least behaving predictably. Relatively speaking, Omori wasn't known for violence. When Watanabe came, all that changed. He arrived bearing candy and cigarettes for the POWs. He smiled and made pleasant conversation, posed for photographs with British officers, and spoke admiringly of America and Britain. For several days, he raised not a ripple. On a Sunday morning, Watanabe approached some POWs crowded in a barracks doorway. A POW named Derek Clark piped up. Gangway to clear a path. That one word sent Watanabe into an explosion. He lunged at Clark, beat him until he fell down, then kicked him. As Bush tried to explain that Clark meant no harm, Watanabe drew his sword and began screaming that he was going to behead Clark. A Japanese officer stopped the attack, but that evening Watanabe turned on Bush, hurling him into a scalding stove, then pummeling and kicking him. After Bush went to bed, Watanabe returned and forced him to his knees. For three hours, Watanabe besieged Bush, kicking him and hacking off his hair with his sword. He left for two hours, then returned again. Bush expected to be murdered. Instead, Watanabe took him to his office, hugged him, and gave him beer and handfuls of candy and cigarettes. Through tears, he apologized and promised never to mistreat another POW. His resolution didn't last. Later that night, he picked up a kendo stick, a long, heavy training sword, and ran shrieking into a barracks, clubbing every man he saw. So we already knew that Watanabe was known to be kind of volatile, right? He just explode for no reason. He's unstable. We totally see this here. He completely abuses a prisoner of war. Then he like weirdly apologizes for it, gives him candy, and then goes back to abusing other prisoners. Watanabe had, in Bush's words, shown his hand. From that day on, both his victims and his fellow Japanese would ponder his violent, erratic, or random behavior and disagree on its cause. To Yuichi Hato, the camp accountant, it was simply madness. Others saw something calculating. After Watanabe attacked Clark, POW officers who had barely noticed him began looking at him with terror. The consequence of his outburst answered a ravening desire. Raw brutality gave him sway over men that his rank did not. Meaning, even though he's not the officer that he wanted to be, just his violence, his unchecked violence, gives him power over some people who are officers. He suddenly saw, after he hit a few men, that he was feared and respected for that, said Wade. And so, that became his style of behavior. Watanabe derived another pleasure from violence. According to Hato, Watanabe was a sexual sadist, freely admitting that that beating prisoners brought him to climax. He did enjoy hurting POWs, wrote Hato. He was satisfying his sexual desire by hurting them. A tyrant was born. Watanabe beat POWs every day, fracturing their windpipes, rupturing their eardrums, shattering their teeth, tearing one man's ear half off, leaving men unconscious. He made one officer sit in a shack, wearing only a fundoshi undergarment for four days in winter. He tied a 65-year-old POW to a tree and left him there for days. He ordered one man to report to him to be punched in the face every night for three weeks. He practiced judo on an appendectomy patient. When gripped in the ecstasy of an assault, he wailed and howled, drooling and frothing, sometimes sobbing, Tears running down his cheeks. So as he's beating these men up, he's sobbing and weeping. Men came to know when an outburst was imminent. Wanabi's right eyelid would sag a moment before he snapped. Very quickly, Wanabi gained a fearsome reputation throughout Japan. Officials at other camps began sending troublesome prisoners to Wanabi for polishing, and Omori was dubbed punishment. In the words of Commander Mayer, who had been transferred from Ofuna to become the ranking Omori POW, Watanabe was the most vicious guard in any prison camp on the main island of Japan. 
two things separated Watanabe from other notorious war criminals. One was the emphasis that he placed on emotional torture. Even by the standards of his honor conscious culture, he was unusually consumed by his perceived humiliation and was intent upon afflicting the same pain on the men under his power. Where men like the, crack, the quack were simply goons, Watanabe combined beatings with acts meant to batter men's psyches. He forced men to bow at pumpkins or trees for hours. He ordered a clergyman POW, so like a pastor, to stand all night saluting a flagpole, shouting the Japanese word for salute, kiri. The experience left the men, the man weeping and out of his mind. He confiscated and destroyed POW family photographs and brought them into his office to show them letters from home, then burned the unopened letters in front of them. To ensure that the men felt utterly hopeless, he changed the manner in which he demanded to be addressed each day, beating anyone who guessed wrong. He ordered men to violate camp policies, then attacked them for breaking the rules. POW Jack Brady summed him up in one sentence. He was absolutely the most sadistic man I ever met. And remember, sadistic means that he takes pleasure from hurting people. And we're seeing that, that this is just crazy behavior. He's so brutal. He hurts people so badly for no reason other than he's taking pleasure from this. The other attribute that separated Watanabe from fellow guards was his inconsistency. Most of the time, he was the wrathful god of Amori. But after beatings, he, he sometimes returned to apologize, often in tears. These fits of contrition, or like where he'd feel remorse and apologize, he'd have regret, usually lasted only moments before the shrieking and punching began again. He would spin from serenity or peace to raving madness in the blink of an eye, usually for no reason. So again, this volatility, right? He just flips from peace to like crazy violent in one second for no reason. One POW recalled seeing him gently praise a a POW, fly into a rage and beat the POW unconscious, then amble to his office and eat his lunch with the placidity, calmness of a grazing cow. So he just goes, beat someone until they go unconscious and then just goes for a lunch break. When Watanabe wasn't thrashing POWs, he was forcing them to be his buddies. He'd wake a POW in the night and be nice as pie, asking the man to join him in his room where he'd serve cookies and talk about literature. Sometimes he'd round up anyone in the camp who could play an instrument or sing, bring them to his room, and host a concert. He expected the men to respond as if they adored him, and at times, he seemed to honestly believe that they did. Maybe he held these gatherings because they left the POWs feeling more stressed than if he were consistently hostile. Or maybe he was just lonely. Among the Japanese at Amori, Watanabe was despised for his haughtiness his boasts about his wealth, and his curtness. So he's really prideful because he's rich, and people really don't like him for that. He made a great show of his education, droning on about nihilism and giving pompous lectures on French literatures at NCO meetings. So he's really snooty about how well-educated he is. None of his colleagues listened. It wasn't the subject matter. It was simply that they loathed him. They hated him. Perhaps this is why he turned to POWs for friendship. The tea parties, wrote Derek Clark, were tense, sitting on the edge of a volcano affairs. Any misstep, any misunderstood word might set Watanabe off, leaving him smashing teapots, upending tables, and pounding his guests into oblivion. After the POWs left, Watanabe seemed to feel humiliated by having had to force friendship from lowly POWs. The next day, he would often deliver a wide-eyed whipping to the previous night's buddies. Like any bully, he had a taste for a particular type of victim. Enlisted men usually received only the occasional slapped face. Officers were in for unrelenting cruelty. So remember, he wanted to be an officer, so these are the people he chooses to harm the most. Among those officers, a few were especially irresistible to him. Some had elevated sta status, such as physicians, chaplains, barracks commanders, and those who'd been highly successful in civilian life. Others he resented because they wouldn't crawl before him. These he singled out and hunted with inexhaustible hatred. So people who wouldn't give in to him, basically. He has inexhaustible. He won't ever get tired of hating them. 
From the moment that Watanabe locked eyes with Louis Zamperini, an officer, a famous Olympian, and a man for whom defiance was second nature, no man obsessed him more. So we find out that because Louis is has this like rebellious spirit and is a famous Olympian and had that officer title that Watanabe wanted, Louis going to be his like arch rival. And on that very disturbed note, we're going to pause at the end of chapter 23.